Hello, I'm Michael Hainsworth. December 6th, the Royal York Hotel played host to the C.D. Howe Institute's fifth region debate, titled Be It Resolved. Canada's immigration levels are too high to support the economic well-being of new immigrants, or that of the broader population. By the end of the evening, clickers in hand, the audience that had started the night undecided, voted for the motion and the arguments put forward by former Alberta Premier Jason Kenney and former Ontario Cabinet Minister and MPP Mitzi Hunter, both Institute Fellows. Speaking against the motion were former Toronto Mayor John Tory, alongside former Calgary Mayor Nahid Nenshi. For a post-mortem and further insight into their arguments, they join us now. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Morning, Michael. Now, I, I knew prior to this debate that Mr. Nenshi would not be able to join us, so I spent the evening jotting down his position so that while I may not be as dynamic and popular as Mr. Nenshi, I, I certainly hope to do a reasonable job representing his position. Otherwise, it's just two of you ganging up on John. No problem. I don't need, I don't, <laughs> we don't want to do that. <laughs> yeah, I, I can imagine after all your years in municipal politics, you, you probably would just sort of feel like it's old times. But not, no. Look, you know what was great about the debate? <laughs> Michael, more than anything else, it was just a good civilized discussion. And yes, we had opposite sides to argue, but it was a good civilized discussion about a really important uh, subject matter. Now, Mitzi, we started that evening with you, and, and I'd like to again, uh, because you opened your argument by pointing out that someone came up to you before the event and said, so, you're against immigration. And I think it's important to point out that this discussion isn't about closing borders or, or building walls. Yeah, so... Actually, it, probably a half a dozen people came up to me during the reception saying, I'm really interested in what your position is going to be. And I, I think that's because, you know, I've spent my life and my career on the public policy side uh, looking for opportunities for newcomers to integrate into labor market. You know, when I was working at Goodwill, I did a lot of work on workforce development at Civic Action, the Diversity Fellows, as John would know. So I've always been on the sort of the negative side of the question of is Canada's immigration rate too high for the well-being of the those that are coming here in all, uh, our society as a whole and our economy as a whole. And so, you know, for me, I had to really dig deep in preparing for the debate to find a position that I was comfortable in. Because, you know, this was not about whether we support immigration or not. I'm an immigrant myself. Of course I support immigration. This was about, is our system working so that when newcomers come to this country, that they are able to really live out their best possible potential, just like my brothers and I have had an opportunity to do uh, when we immigrated all the way back in the 1970s. And so I started my introductory arguments with a reflection that has really shaped my life. It was one of my earliest memories um, and warmest memories really of coming into this country. And it was, if I may, I share in this format, it was, you know, after my family and I had had gone out for the evening and uh, there was a massive snowstorm, of course, and um, the plows had come through in our on our street. We lived on a cul-de-sac in Pickering and, you know, this, this big giant snowbank was there. And, you know, I had two older brothers at the time and they piled out of the car, jumped over the snowbank, went inside. And I was really surprised that my mom did as well. I was wondering, how did she make it over that snowbank? And I was looking up as a small child and I just thought, oh my God, I'm never going to get over this bank to get inside my house. And just at that moment, my dad swooped down. He picked me up, you know, big and strong and warm. One step, he cleared the snowbank and we were inside. And it was that moment and feeling of belonging that, that I recall as, as sort of like my earliest memory of being in Canada. And I, I really felt that you know, that's what newcomers want. They want that sense of belonging. They want that sense of inclusion. And, you know, we know the horror stories that are happening because of the housing crisis. You know, people living on streets uh, who, who come here as asylum seekers and refugees. And that's not the welcome that we want. You know, we, we want to make sure that people are set up for success.
You brought up an interesting point at the very beginning that that I, I, I firmly believe in, is that if you take a position on one side or another, you should be able to argue the other side. Otherwise, you have not fully done y your research. Uh, John, Nahid brought up the topic of low productivity. Uh, it's been an issue for Canada's economy for years. His argument was that we only have four options, have more babies, work into our 70s, get a lot poorer, or more immigration. Well, you see, Michael, I think that is the question. By the way, I was sitting here smiling to myself as Missy was talking and thinking down here in Toronto, and even distinguished from Pickering and certainly from Jason and Alberta, we would have called the Army to fix with that snowbank. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Famously uh, done by a previous uh, predecessor to myself. But look, I think we were debating, in a sense, the wrong question, because it, it, from my standpoint, in the context of making sure not just that we can remain prosperous as a country, and prosperity isn't about just how much money you have, but rather it's about our ability to make sure people can have good jobs and good housing, and that we have the capacity in the country to care for people who are more vulnerable, especially as we get more and more people who are older. And if you look at all the statistics, and I made reference to this in the debate, um, there there are more people today uh, more seniors, if you want to call it seniors, that are relying on those who are working to produce the, the wealth and the income necessary to finance health care and other kinds of care than was the case in the 70s. And of course, that number is going to continue to leap uh, as we uh, you know go forward to the 2030s. And, and so back to the head's choice. I mean, you can have more babies, but that doesn't seem to be on the, on the, uh, you know, on the horizon in terms of the birth rate here. It's been stable for quite some time. Um, you can accept the fact we're going to become poorer as a country. And that doesn't just mean poorer in terms of our buying power, but it means poorer in terms of our ability to finance the programs that, um, you know, people have come to rely on as just part of the Canadian experience. Um, or you can, uh, you can work until you're in your 70s, and some people will choose to do that, and that's fine, but I don't think it represents the answer. Or you can have immigration. And I think the issue is not about a number, in my respectful view, but it is about how well or how poorly we settle the people that we need. I don't think that if I said at the debate, I mean, okay, you could take the number and adjust it by plus or minus 10%. Um, and, and that's fine. I don't have any problem with that based on whatever the calculations seem to suggest is best. But I think what we really need to do rather than argue or debate the number is settle people more effectively when it comes to language and the kind of skills they bring, their integration into the economy and the professions and so on. Um, and, uh, we need to do that, and we need to take a look at the composition of the people that are coming in uh, the country rather than sort of say somehow this 500,000 number, if that is the number, uh, is too much. Because I think actually if you do the math on you know, being able to look after ourselves uh, going forward and be as prosperous a country with a growing economy, uh, you know, and we'll come back to the productivity, I'm sure, sometime during our podcast. But you know, that's a big question too. And it's for the people who are already here are not achieving the kind of levels and improvements in productivity and competitiveness that we need to do in order to grow the economy so that we can look after people. Uh, well, let, let's sort of expand upon that. And, and Jason, you know, some of the people I spoke to after the debate pointed out how engaging it, it was, and at times funny. You know, Nahid Nenshi's callback joke that he kept agreeing with you on certain points w w as an example. It was funny at some points. Um, and it was really compelling. Hi, I'm Asamo Tamini. I'm a dig digital leader at Deloitte. Housing is uh, obviously a big problem that needs to be solved, but uh, really about uh, settlement and integration, I feel like, is another problem that we can solve. Um, my background's in technology, and I feel like there's a lot of technology solutions we can implement to be able to solve them. We just need to be more innovative and solution-oriented. So I feel like it's possible. I was on the negative side uh, at the end of the day, um, but it was very, very difficult. But I, I feel like they made some better arguments, especially that to solve the problem, you have to solve the problem and not make it some other problem. That that's piece really stuck with me. If I understand your argument correctly, you were saying that we need to pull back on the number of new Canadians coming into the country so we can ensure that the social safety net can catch them? Uh, well, yes, absolutely, in part. Now, I just for starters, uh, of course, Michael, I served as Canada's longest ever serving Minister of Immigration. And during those five years, maintained what were up to then the highest sustained relative levels of immigration. I mean, there were a few years back uh, in the early part of the last century, we had higher numbers and we were trying to settle the West. But I was known for maintaining pretty robust immigration levels. So let's 
be clear, I'm not making an anti-immigration argument. I don't think anybody on the stage was. Um, I was making a realistic immigration uh, argument. Uh, I always used to say as immigration minister that Canada is a welcome and gener- welcoming and generous country, uh, that we are fortunate to be one of the only democracies with a fairly broad pro-immigration consensus, but we have to be intentional about keeping it that way. And the only way we do is if we demonstrate that immigration is working both for newcomers broadly and for the country uh, and, and its economy. Um, and that means we need to recognize that there are practical limits uh, to how many people we can welcome in a given year. And I, I think it's manifestly obvious right now that we're exceeding those levels that with an immigration target, a permanent residence of half a million a year. I mean, let's talk about the numbers. Uh, 500,000 a year, um, wh- which that in itself uh, far exceeds anything in Canadian history and anything in the rest of the developed world. But on top, but it doesn't, it kind of uh, obscures the real numbers because uh, last year we admitted uh, around 900,000 foreign students, uh, which uh, is a tripling in the past decade, most of whom now have uh, full uh, time work permits, uh, go into the labor market, and about 600,000 temporary foreign workers. We now have two and a half million uh, non-permanent residents living in Canada on an extended basis. This is without precedent. And just last quarter, third quarter of 2023, as uh, John was mentioning before we started, 435,000 new people coming to Canada, of which about 300, sorry, that's population growth, excuse me, of which three quarters was immigration or temporary residence. That's 320,000. To put that in context, we received more people uh, last quarter in three months than we typically would. Uh, in, well, then we almost did in our entire history on an annual basis. And here's the problem. This is in the context of a acute housing crisis. This year, we might build in Canada about 210,000 houses, but receive, uh, uh, you know, uh, like 1.2 million net newcomers. Where are they going to live? There is zero um, vacancy effectively in our largest cities. Uh, housing prices in our largest cities have have doubled in the past decade. Uh, in, middle-income families are now spending upwards of two-thirds of their income on their mortgage payments. Uh, people are in crisis finding a family doctor, getting into emergency wards. So there are very pra- infrastructure. I got into a cab at Pearson the other day to go to downtown Toronto, and uh, my driver told me it was going to take an hour. He said he remembers the day when it took 20, 25 minutes. And he st- at this, this gentleman was an immigrant to Canada from Punjab. And he started telling me how the current government has, uh, has, has gone way overboard. We don't have the infrastructure to match it. And finally, I would just point out, per John's point, yes, we do have a demographic issue with the declining birth rate. But the C.D. Howe Institute's own research, several papers done by uh, Bill Robson and others, demonstrate that immigration alone is not a solution, not a realistic solution to the aging of our population. You would have to more or less quadruple the already stratospherically high levels in order to maintain the current age ratio dependency or the sorry age dependency ratio of our population of workers uh, to retirees. So I think there's other ways of getting at these productivity issues. Um, and, 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 you know, Michael, look, I, I just want to say, I don't dispute for a moment or, or, or call into question the fact that, as Jason says, immigration is not the answer to our, you know, future continued prosperity and our ability to finance social programs. But I do think that part of what Jason and Mitzi were arguing that night, and I made a big point of talking perhaps to excess in terms of the well-being of our side of the of, of the persuading the audience, that, you know, we have real problems in our country in terms of uh, putting immigration entirely aside, uh, taking the steps, making the investments, having the kind of government policy that is not high tax and high regulation so that you have more innovation, more investment and more improvements to competitiveness. We are doing really poorly uh, on all of those accounts going down where other countries in the world are going up. But having said that, I think that, you know, what, what Jason was just arguing to me is that often typically Canadian the sort of way we do things, which is to say, well, you know, if, if we really need these people, except we just can't accommodate them, then the solution is to sort of, you know, give up and reduce the number when we know we need these people to help us build our country and build our economy, as opposed to saying, let's find ways to build more housing faster with modular housing and other kinds of things. Let's find ways to make sure that we can, you know, more uh, integrate people better. So, that, I mean, some of the people that are coming in that 500,000 are doctors that can help 
with family doctor shortages. And some of them are construction workers, which we desperately need, or we should get more construction workers um, to help fill out those ranks. So I think, you know, to me, it's a matter, of, as usual, I think, especially in this country, and especially with this debating panel, it's a matter of finding that balance to say, you know, maybe it isn't just adjusting the 500,000 number, but it's adjusting some of those other numbers. And the government has taken some steps on the student front uh, to do that so that it's not really 1.2 million, you know, which I wouldn't argue is uh, absorbable if there is such a word uh, readily by this country at this point. But I just think we have to decide we're going to sort of, you know, suck it up and actually do some of the things to integrate better and to have more language classes and more um, uh, you know, uh, selectivity when it comes to the kind of people that we're having come to the country, as opposed to saying, let's just cut back the number when we need those people. 10 years from now, somebody will be really sorry that we cut that number in half if that's what the public policy answer was. And we're suddenly finding we're short of people. The productivity of the country has gone down even further. Uh, you know, we're not able to finance the programs for older people, uh, of which I'll be one by then. So we'll be sorry if we do that. It's a short-sighted decision. You sort of brought up a, an interesting point that, that Mr. Uh, Nenshi had mentioned as well, which was housing and, and that, that integration. And uh, let's solve those problems as opposed to pulling back the reins on immigration. Let's solve the problems of housing. Let's solve the problems of, of, of immigration. Rocco Rossi, CEO of the Ontario Chamber of Commerce. I, I don't believe we should reduce immigration. I believe we need a ton more focus on solving the problems that increased immigration has exposed, which we've been dealing with housing issues, health care issues, accreditation issues, labor mobility within our country, our crazy interprovincial barriers which lead to inefficient mobility of, uh, of labor. So yes, we need to focus on that, but there should be still this incredible sense of urgency added and not simply to say let the number go where it will don't worry we'll figure out the solutions that doesn't give enough urgency to the need on the solution side to jason and, and to mitzi if pulling back the reins is the solution to what degree what's the if, if you throw out a bunch of numbers jason what's the magic number to create uh, a, a more level uh, input of of uh, new Canadians coming into this country uh, to ensure that everybody is getting what they need. Well, I, there, go ahead, let, Mitzi, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Sure, I just want to say um, there's no question that our population growth, at, you know, 98% is is through immigration and, and through newcomers. And, and that's something that Canada needs and uh, and we welcome. The, the fact is, is that we have no mechanism for gauging how many people we can absorb and, and that we need. And so, you know, I know. So we don't even know what the magic number is. We don't know what the magic. We, well, we, we don't know. And we don't have a mechanism to find out. You know, one of the things I proposed in the debate was that we need a barometer. Let's, you know, convene and the federal government uh, should lead this to convene all of the actors you know, bring together the colleges and the universities together with the business people who are relying on, um, you know, foreign worker programs and and come to the table along with the three orders of government. So the province and the cities and the municipalities where, you know, we are expecting that they are coordinating services on the ground. Well, how can they coordinate if they don't even know what the number is? And, and so this is, um, this is something that we should invest in. Yes, it will take time, but it's not impossible. You know, one of the things I also pointed out was the, you know, every minute and a half, someone new is arriving here in Canada. And, and so, you know, it happens so, so quickly. And the, the solutions, like building more housing, doesn't happen as quickly. And so that is why we have to, you know, to lower the number, regulate the number, gauge the number so that we can actually do a better job of absorbing and setting people up for success in the long term. Michael, if, if, and I, I agree with, with Mitzi, if I could just um, maybe segue to what some of the academic research on this is saying. For example, uh, uh, Mikkel Scottrude at University of Waterloo, who I think is uh, 
undoubtedly one of the country's leading experts on these issues. He's recently published a major paper in the Journal of Labor Economics with a group of scholars. And essentially, he says that that the the optimal number is the number where you, you see uh, that uh, net immigrants are doing uh, better than the general population in the ec- economically uh, and where they're contributing to growth and per capita gross domestic product. Now, uh, to get a little wonky, this is the C.D. Howe Institute after all, so we need to get a bit wonky. Canada has been experiencing a really worrying decline in per capita GDP. It's true. A newcomer arrives and helps to increase overall demand in the economy, services, etc. But if they're making substantially less than, uh, for example, they're receiving in government transfers or or less, th- b- b- well below average incomes, they're actually, unfortunately, we're seeing a decline in per capita GDP. And Canada is at the lowest level in the OECD in terms of per capita GDP growth because we're well in the, in the negative side of this. So what Mike, Professor Scudrud and others are saying is, that we need to get the numbers more realistically at a more realistic level, but also get back to uh, what we used to call a human capital model of immigration focused on people who have the skills that are we know will most likely lead uh, to successful uh, economic outcomes. And now, let me just say, I said I called in the debate for the Trudeau approach, the Pierre Trudeau approach. And if you want to talk numbers here, when we hit the 1981 recession. Uh, Pierre Trudeau, nobody accused of being some kind of anti-immigrant xenophobe, cut immigration levels by 40 percent, 40 percent. Why? Because he followed the classic economic view that you ought not to add large numbers of new entrants into a labor market that was shrinking. And so uh, I think that I, I mean, that, that, that's a benchmark I would look at. Um, that would just bring us back to our normal historical levels, by the way. That would still be relatively high but, but Mike, in the developed world. Mike, and on the, uh, Mike, we don't, we don't have, have a problem point, with I think it's a really important point, and, and, and I don't think we even disagree on it. But, you know, again, I think what Jason is talking about is, is absolutely correct on everything he said about our productivity, uh, you know, per hour worked and all that kind of thing dropping down and among the worst in the world, the, the developed world. But that, you know, masks a fundamental problem that goes way beyond immigration in that that would not be a problem if the jobs we were creating here were value-added jobs and we were making proper innovation and in, proper investment in innovation and in things to improve our competitiveness, which then, you know, by definition, uh, you know, improve uh, the productivity per hour or the output GDP output per hour. And I would argue again that that is what we should be attacking. And, you know, I have no problem with making some adjustment in the 500,000 number, but not to the point of saying, well, let's cut it in half because things are, are difficult right now. We're not in a recession. The, the economy is struggling. People are struggling with uh, affordability. I don't think we're really in the kind of recession that was happening in the 1980s, for sure, according to what everybody says. And so, but this is how what happens in Canada. We get distracted into saying, well, fine then. The answer is going to be to cut immigration in half, as opposed to saying, let's spend a bit of time, you know, talking about both what the government has to do to you know, make this a more attractive place to invest that not isn't high taxes and high regulation, but also what the private sector has to do, because it is just government here. I mean, the private sector have, for one reason or another, you know, not made some of the investments and some, they'll, some of that they'll blame on public policy, but some of it's just been their own decision to be, I'll call it conservative, and it's a, a bad use of the word conservative, in, in making the kind of investments they should have made. And again, it, maybe that's a function of us being a bit fat and sassy because we live next door to the United States and think we don't have to. We do. But I just I just don't want us to, in this podcast or anywhere else in the country, have the simplistic answer of saying, let's cut back on immigration because that's going to somehow make the economy better. It's, it's not in the long term. It, it, it won't. Absolutely not. Most people think about economic objectives, but of course, there's a lot more that immigration brings Canada than, than economics, and sometimes I think maybe we're talking too much about the economic objectives. And I'm an economist, Mikhail Skucherud, and I'm a professor in the economics department at the University of Waterloo. The immigration system has three arms. It's a humanitarian arm, it's a family reunification arm, and an economic class arm. And what's happening over time is the humanitarian share of total immigration is falling in Canada, and I don't hear anybody talking about that. But I think that's where we can actually make the biggest difference. I think it's a big, big step for Canada to have a public 
frank and open conversation about immigration. I, I sometimes think that we've lost sight of some of the other objectives and, and, the, and the other goals of immigration. Mitzi, do we tighten the spigot on all three of these arms of the immigration process? It's for us to be realistic about what number we can handle on an annual basis. You know, when you think of the humanitarian, those are the refugees and the asylum seekers, we are doing an abysmal job at settling people into this country who come here um, fleeing, you know, situations in, in their home country. You know, we just had a, a, a man who in Branson, unfortunately, he, he died in a tent, you know, and, and we, we know that you know, students um, are living in tents or in unsafe housing. Um, you know, many of them uh, are being exploited. Uh, there's risk of human trafficking when people become exposed to to desperate situations. And you know, we haven't really invested in the nonprofits to help on the settlement side. We are way behind our targets when it comes to housing. You know, we need to create and, and build 6 million more housing uh, by 2030. Um, it's going to require $3 trillion. So it has to be all sectors that rolls up its sleeves to meet that that need and that demand. And so, you know, I... I believe that, you know, this is something that is so important to Canada's growth and, and future well-being that we we must make the necessary investments up front so that we can welcome people here, settle them here as quickly as possible, and so that people who are new to Canada can actually have that hope and that dream and that optimism that really does, you know, create the entrepreneurs and 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 the innovators that that we have have historically relied on. You know, I, I use the example of uh, Mary's Brigadero. She's a, a chocolate maker, a newcomer. She now has two locations. And one of those right down the street from me. It's the worst thing that ever happened to me. It, I know it's so delicious. It melts in your mouth. It's like fabulous chocolate. Bringing all of this to her her country that she's chosen to settle in you know what i what i we need more people like that but what i worry also is that you know 20% of newcomers uh, are leaving because they they haven't found an opportunity to 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 settle here in the best possible way for themselves and their families and uh, and so we just are at a bit of a risk if we don't get it right and um you know I also worry about the sentiments of the Canadian population in terms of those who, you know, see newcomers are the the problem for the housing crisis, which is not really the case. It's it's that we ha we need to coordinate better and, and plan and prepare. Well, I want to turn to, to John then, uh, to your point, Mitzi, about the investment that, that's necessary. You know, John, uh, Mr. Nenshi's argument also hinged on the idea that we needed to do a better job of, of integration. We heard that from the jury as well. As someone who ran Canada's largest city and the biggest contributor to GDP, um, help me understand the money side of the equation because I, I remember when we had Mike Harris uh, create the, the mega city, uh, uh, the amalgamation of all the municipalities. There was a lot of downloading of social services that you know over time ended up to a degree being uploaded back to the province as well. Where should the money be coming from to ensure that we have the social programs necessary to integrate those who are coming to this country? Does it fall on the municipal level? Should it be a provincial prerogative or is this a federal government top-down approach? Well, I think your, your expression that it falls on the municipal government is correct because that's what ends up happening. You know, but cities in terms of their revenue raising abilities are just not equipped uh, to finance all these kinds of things uh, that amount to social programs. And they weren't intended to. I mean, cities were intended to use property taxes, their principal you know, source of revenue to finance basic core services for people, the police, the fire, the pick up the garbage, uh, you know, provide the water, and so forth. And so I think the answer to your question is uh, both of the other governments have to contribute, and they do. 
the question is just uh, the, the the problem is just not enough. And so I think when it comes to the basic settlement monies that are needed to go to these wonderful uh, settlement organizations, Mitzi made reference to, um, they need to take their numbers and say, fine, if those are the numbers that are right, and I would argue that they're you know plus or minus not far off what we need to do to grow the country and support and social programs, then the settlement money has to match that in, in terms of, of increasing it as well. And I don't think that has happened. In fact, I'm pretty sure it has not. Um, and then on the provincial side, uh, you need to make sure that for things like healthcare and in particular, I would say education, and maybe that thing that sort of falls in between, which is integration into professions and, and, and training and so forth, that money has to come from the provincial government. Because I wouldn't argue for one second that we should maintain numbers close to what we're doing and at the same time not increase uh, the resources made available to the settlement organizations and to the immigrants to make sure they can uh, find their way. Um, that is something that I said during the debate is that, you know, it isn't about the number and it isn't about changing the number to sort of solve the problem. And this, the problem, as Ed said very well in the debate, will be solved by addressing, you know, why there are strains put on the system, which is inadequate resources put to integrating and settling people, inadequate resources put to people like uh, things like language programs. 80% of the people coming in the country now have neither English nor French as their first language. And they, a lot of them have trouble communicating. But they have skills in their head from where they came from to be a, a professional or some other kind of person, but they need to communicate. So to me, that's part of the answer is, you know, making sure we allocate the resources necessary to settle people um, and uh, that that fall, must fall in our system with the taxation powers either given or not given to cities uh, must fall on the other two governments, provincial and federal, probably led by the federal government because they're setting the number at the end of the day for immigration. The bottom line is that we can't have doctors come in here and be Tim Horton servers. Wes Hall, executive chairman and founder of We Shall Investments. I am a juror tonight. It was, uh, it was fireworks. It was amazing, actually. We absolutely need immigration in this country, period, full stop. But the way we're going about it, we need to have a reset. The most important day of their lives, when they got that letter from the government saying, come to Canada, and they get here, and they go, wait a minute, this is not the Canada expected. So that has to change. We have to settle people quicker and we have to integrate them into a society faster. We can't have engineers coming here and be Uber drivers. 50% were economic immigrants, meaning that they're not a burden to our society. They're an additive to our society. So when they come here, let them do what we brought them here to do. Jason, would you be in favor of, of cutting back on the number of immigrants coming into the country while simultaneously increasing the federal funding for those who do arrive? You know, I, I really, look, I, I, when I was a minister of immigration, I, we increased pretty substantially the settlement funding. Um, but that is not a solution to the housing crisis, to the healthcare crisis. Um, that is not a solution to the growing poverty amongst immigrants to Canada or our declining productivity. At the best, it is, it is marginal. So per perhaps something needs to be done. But, I, but can I just, uh, again, this is the C.D. Howe Institute, and, and it deals with uh, a hard economic reality. As I said in the debate, we Canadians, we are soft-hearted, but we are also hard-headed. Every government in this country is running large deficits. Um, we're plunging into, into debt. Tax levels, I, I believe, are, are too high. One of the reasons why we're, uh, we're, our national wealth are, are, is, is declining and so all of this new spending that, that John and Nahed were implying has to be paid for somehow. Um, look, none of this gets to the basic problem, which is, you know, for example, uh, we're building not even enough new homes to welcome the immigrants who arrived just in the last three months. We're not building enough homes in an entire year and not even to begin dealing with the, um, the price uh, uh, crisis as, as rents are going up across the country. Uh, and housing prices become increasingly unaffordable. If you want to see Canada move from having a, a historically broad pro-immigration consensus in our politics to a backlash, then we should continue doing more of the same. This deeply concerns me. And by the way, this is not xenophobic sentiment. Immigrants are the most likely people in the polling to say that immigration levels should be reduced because they're the folks that come in at the bottom of the labor market, the, the most struggling to find a new, uh, to find a family doctor. Um, we have foreign students sleeping in shifts in, 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 in apartments in Toronto to share rent 
Uh, we have refugees sleeping on the street. This is becoming a crisis. So I think wishful thinking that the government can wave a wand and, and, and give more money to settlement organizations, et cetera, to so solve the solution, solve, solve the problem that we all agree exists is, is, is quite frankly unrealistic. There, there are deeper challenges, there are deeper solutions to the demographic challenge. One is, yes, let's try to increase the birth rate through things like, I would argue, pronatal policies like, uh, the, the, the child benefit, uh, it, perhaps income splitting. Let's emulate Japan and other countries on, on helping um, older workers extend their, their, their life span in the workplace, which is, uh, uh, you know, as, as life expectancy grows, that's economically necessary. Let's, uh, it, it, John's absolutely right, the private sector has to invest more in, 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 in productivity. But let's also get back to the, so selecting newcomers who we know based on our data are more likely to succeed, and, on a, and finally, on this point, you asked about the uh, the different the three arms you called it of um, humanitarian, family class, and economic. Here's the truth: uh, only about twenty percent of the five hundred thousand permanent residents selected are selected based on economic criteria. The rest are either their dependents or subsequently sponsored family members or humanitarian. In addition to this enormous and growing population of temporary residents being students and temporary foreign workers. Altogether, we are headed towards, I think, a very serious uh, social problem in this country at these levels. I know it's Mitzi's turn, Michael, but let me just say, if you want to see an example of wishful thinking, because Jason was taking just a tiny, gentle shot as he would, um, you know, it's wishful thinking to think Canadians are going to suddenly start having more babies. I mean, that train left the station a long time ago in the context of people just deciding for whatever series of reasons, which could include economic. It could include housing costs. Have, as many children, and housing, the whole thing. But people are not going to start having more children in Canada. I mean, I, it, to any significant extent to solve this problem, and it is a problem. So I just think that's wishful thinking that we're going to have the four solutions that Nahed mentioned, that that's going to be the one that's going to skate us on side economically. It's not. The issue of housing, first of all, is a very important issue. Abdul Asman, a student, Master of Public Policy, Administration and Law at York University. We need really funding from all levels of government, including the private sector, non-profit organizations, and all stakeholders to come together in order to address that issue, and it's very important. Yeah, so this is a perfect segue to what I wanted to, to speak about, <clears throat> which is our policy has to line up with the outcomes that we are seeking. And, you know, one of one of the the policy shifts that we've made uh, in the last few years is on childcare and making sure that we we have a national childcare program and that we're lowering the cost of, of childcare moving towards ten dollars a day. That is allowing more choices for families. More women can enter the labor market and that directly impacts Canada's productivity. When it comes to international students, and, and we know, you know, there are food banks that are closing their doors and saying we are not going to serve international students because we cannot keep up with the demand for food and the need for food uh, in, in, our, in our communities. And, and it's just tragic. Well, look at the policy behind this and what are some of those causes. You know, if you have... Um, the cutting of tuition by 10% and, you know, not um, giving colleges and universities an opportunity to raise the, the revenues that they need to keep up with their costs, you know, but you don't say anything about international students. <clears throat> what many of these institutions have done is that they have increased the tuition fees for international students and the, the net number that they're bringing in. Massive numbers are coming in, you know, almost 900,000 uh, in, the, in, the, in the current year. What that does is that it, it really puts a lot of pressure on all of our systems and all of our communities that are serving those students. Housing, we've already talked about that. And, you know, the recent change in the government policy of requiring not $10,000 in terms of living costs, which you, you're not able to pay rent and buy food with that. The government has now increased it to twenty thousand dollars, a much more realistic number to signal to those international students coming here what the true cost will be 
of being able to support yourself while you're studying and, uh, you know, without relying on food banks and other things to get by. And and so the the po- the policy has to line up with the outcomes that we are we are seeking, and um, and when it comes to immigration, there are many other levers that we could be focused on to ensure that you know that they are succeeding when they arrive to this country in whatever capacity, whether it's through the foreign worker program, uh, the international student program or for humanitarian responses. Like, you know, Michael, if, if the number of uh, international students is part of the, the challenge that we face, and there is no question that when, when you hear Jason's math of all the numbers, not just the, the people coming in the, through, I'll call it ordinary, you know, immigration, permanent residence, uh, and you add to that the students and the refugees, and, and you do end up with a very high number, um, you know, I think, again, being realistic, just as I said, I don't think people are going to rush out and start having more babies. Uh, it, you're not going to get much of a push on anybody's part to start limiting the number of foreign students. Why not? Because, and, and it's controversial to say, but it's just true. A lot of our post-secondary institutions around the country, because of, I would argue in part, um, inadequate financing of the core of the per student allocation, uh, have come to be addicted to the money that uh, comes with international students on the tuition side. It's very unhealthy for the health of what, one of our absolute competitive advantages, which is our excellent system of post-secondary education, but it's very unhealthy and makes it very difficult for any government, it would be the feds, that would say, we're going to have less of these uh, foreign students, international students, because they, they will get a huge pushback from people they have underfunded uh, to say, we can't, you know, we're, we're going to be in a crisis if you limit that number. I mean, we heard at the debate, I think it was the head that mentioned that there's one institution in the east part of Toronto that has 60% of its students international. You know, it's actually Centennial College uh, uh, here in Scarborough. They're the best and the brightest coming from all over the world. I'm proud of that. But at the same time, um, you know, that institution has got to be, you know, I don't know, I've not seen their financial statement. They're going to have an unhealthy reliance on international students. And it's it, going to it, be very it's, difficult. It's actually, that we, we actually have some colleges uh, in the GTA that are closer to 80% foreign students now. And I don't buy this notion that, that, that they're all, they've all been terribly impoverished by uh, the provincial government. Look, this is not universities, by the way. This is not the un- universities are, uh, uh, broadly speaking, the, I mean, the first tier research degree granting universities are bringing in, I, I would argue, historic levels of, of, of foreign students. It is the community college sector that are, are, have massively increased their budgets, their revenue, their institutional empires. Um, and there's been no accountability on this. And you know who's losing out on this? The foreign students many of whom are uh, being exploited by immigration agents, um, quite typically in India, uh, that's where the significant majority are coming from. Families are mortgaging their farms uh, to buy, to, to, to acquire a, um, a, a st- study permit and a labor market impact assessment to get into the country uh, as either a TFW or foreign student. And they do so on the, with the understanding, the belief that that visa is going to translate eventually into permanent residency. Here's, here's the point. That's two and a half million temporary residents living in a country, the vast majority of whom believe that that's going to translate into permanent residency. We mean that when their visas run out, a lot of them are going to overstay and we're going to end up with a long-term um, population of people living here illegally. This is also This is also going to undermine the integrity of the whole system and 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 create further exploitation. Yeah, and, and at the risk of this on... conversation continuing on for another sixty minutes or so, I, I think it's super critical that we we uh, tackle one last issue, and, and I'll, perhaps we'll do it as a as, as a round robin. Jason, we can start with you, uh, Mr. Tory, on to you, uh, and then Ms. Hunter uh, as well. Uh, Mr. Nancy called Canadian immigration the greatest bait and switch system for those who are accepted but can't work in their chosen profession. How do we overcome the professional industry and political pushback to recognize accreditation? That's to me first. Well, I I spent an enormous amount of time on that, both as a federal minister and as premier. And I can can say that that real progress has been made. Every provincial government has brought in uh, legislation, um, and, and most of the professional regulatory bodies have streamlined their procedures. We do need to maintain the Canadian standard. The idea of rubber stamping people, like a, a medical doctor from a developing country, uh, in many cases will not have the same st- standard that we would expect uh, for, for uh, a Canadian physician. So there, d- d- there has to be a process. 
Um, but I think what we try, what I tried to get at was having Immigration Canada work with the professional regulatory bodies so that when we assess somebody as a doctor for purposes of, for example, the point system, um, that we, we would, they would already have gone through a pre-assessment before they get here. Rather than driving a cab, proverbially, uh, they could be productive in their home country and arrive here knowing they can get their credentials. But let me just say this, uh, Michael, when I created the express entry system, which is part of our point system, Federal Skilled Worker Program, out of 1,400 points assigned for human capital, we selected our first draw was based on, I think, like 1,300 of points. The current federal government has now lowered the draw to 75 points. They've effectively killed the point system that was the hallmark of Canada's immigration success. That's, that's going to hurt, not help this problem of credential recognition. I, I don't uh, disagree with almost all of what Jason said both in terms of a system that was working well that has been altered, uh, perhaps to sort of goose the numbers, as it were, that we've been talking about. Uh, but secondly, I also don't uh, I disagree with him at all that we have made progress on the integration front. But our, you know, again, the Canadian way is to say we've made such progress. Let's just sit back and admire our Andy. We've got to do more. I mean, we have to necess not necessarily do things faster, but just better in terms of that integration. I mean, we are still short of doctors. We are still short of nurses. And I entirely agree with Jason. We should never sacrifice our standards, but we can find ways to have these transitional uh, programs for doctors and nurses and many other kinds of workers uh, and, and uh, uh, you know, we, we fill our need and make sure it's to our standard. And, and of course, then we have to look at something else that was referred to. We don't have time to get back up onto it, as you say, but that is we need structural workers and skilled grades and so forth. And we've got to, you know, put a focus on that. And but to me, that doesn't involve cutting back the numbers. It involves a much more focused effort on the numbers that we're going to take in, plus or minus. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I was thinking about about your question and and uh, reflecting on my time as uh, minister responsible for post secondary in Ontario and you know for colleges and universities as well as the skilled trades. And the fact of the matter is that we have many sectors that, because of the aging population and the numbers of retirees uh, or the the pivot that's occurring in certain industries like electric vehicles and, uh, and in, in clean tech that are demanding new and different skills. And, and there are labor shortages in some of these key economic areas. And, and so we are needing reliant, and I know that our institutions across this country are able to meet that challenge of doing the pivot that they need to do on credentialism, there are micro skills that, that are being targeted and uh, and making sure that that we are able to take this wonderful talent that is coming into our country and that is already here and making sure that it is um, ready and able to meet the need in terms of these these core growth industries. And and so to, to me, I am excited by this debate because it is a wonderful opportunity for Canada to meet this moment. We are a country that immigrants want to come to. We have a lineup of people that could wrap the globe that want to come here. The, what we have to make sure is that we have those systems, including our academic and our post-secondary education and our skill and our training systems that are ready to um, provide the the necessary support um, so that they can succeed, and it is going to require many industries, perhaps all industries, to to change and uh, to to have those um, investments that are needed. And uh, and by the way, business also needs to make investment in training as well. Uh, it's not just um, the academic institutions and government. Businesses also have to do their part uh, to make sure that they have. Um, the ready labor supply uh, to meet their their demands as well. Well, this has been a, a fascinating conversation and an, an adjunct to uh, a, a very interesting and engaging night uh, down at the Royal York Hotel in, in early December. Thank you all for your time. And Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thank you. Pleasure. Mitzi Hunter is a former Ontario Cabinet Minister and MPP and a C.D. Howe Fellow. Also an Institute Fellow, Jason Kenney, the former Premier of Alberta. John Tory is the former Mayor of Toronto. For more on the Regent debates, visit cdhow.org. I'm Michael Hainsworth. Thanks for joining us.
You've been listening to the C.D. Howe Institute podcast with Michael Hainsworth. Subscribe on iTunes, Google Play, and Spotify. The C.D. Howe Institute is an independent, not-for-profit research institute whose mission is to raise living standards by fostering economically sound public policies. The Institute is widely considered to be Canada's most influential think tank and a trusted source of essential policy intelligence, distinguished by nonpartisan, evidence-based research and subject to definitive expert review. Visit cdhow.org and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Thank you.